This talk is about unsafe Rust. Uh, and in particular, it's about some of the tricky rules that come up when we write unsafe Rust that can cause undefined behavior in our programs when we break them. I'm going to use the same strategy that I used in the last talk that I recorded. So there's going to be a lot of examples of like Rust on one side and C or C++ on the other side, where the two programs are doing the same thing or very similar things. And that'll let us kind of zoom into the nitty gritty differences between what they're doing. Uh, and we'll see some interesting rules that exist on one side, but not the other. Uh, so the goal is for this talk to be accessible to Rust programmers, of course, but also C and C++ programmers uh, who may have heard of Rust or seen my last talk, but don't write Rust. Uh, hopefully this is broadly accessible. Um, we do often say that unsafe Rust, writing unsafe Rust is kind of like writing C. Uh, and that is a that is a reasonable analogy, right? Uh, you know, there are rules and the compiler does not check them. And if you break them, you get undefined behavior. Uh, that's true in both cases. There's a lot of similarities, but there are also differences. And when we zoom in to these examples, we'll see some of those differences. We'll see some examples that look very similar on both sides. And the C side or the C++ side is a perfectly well-defined program that doesn't trigger any sanitizers or anything like that. And the Rust side is undefined behavior uh, that prints the wrong output, right? We'll see some examples like that. We'll see several examples like that. And we'll even see some examples of C code that exhibits undefined behavior, prints the wrong answer, uh, when the equivalent looking unsafe Rust code is fine and does not have uh, undefined behavior. So there are, we'll see some rules on both sides of the equation here, particularly around uh, pointer aliasing uh, there are some tricky rules in C++ and C uh, that come up around pointer aliasing, which we sometimes forget about, but they're always there and we have to watch out for them. We'll dive all the way in uh, and we'll look at some assembly output. We'll look at a lot of Godbolt examples. The one on the screen right now is a Godbolt example. We'll look at a lot of Godbolt examples. I'll link to all of them in the description of this video. We'll see some assembly code. We'll see how the undefined behavior manifests itself in the assembly. <clears throat> and then we'll come up at the end, come up for error, and sort of think about the question of why our languages do this. Like, why is, it a good, why is it a good idea to have tricky rules like this in our languages? There is a payoff, there's a reason, and we'll look at that at the end. So that's our game plan here. So let's jump right in. The first example here uh, is hopefully some pretty familiar, either pretty familiar Rust on the left or pretty familiar C++ on the right. In both cases, this is code that is bad. Uh, in the C++ case, we have a dangling pointer here. We're creating a dangling pointer. In the Rust case, it's going to end up being a compiler error, but it would have been a dangling pointer. Um, very quickly, right, we create a vector. We take a const pointer into that vector. On the Rust side, they're going to call that a shared reference. Uh, we're not going to say much about Rust syntax or even Rust basics, but just the bare minimum we need to look at these examples. We'll say here, uh, Rust is going to call this a shared reference, so it's sort of const by default, uh, you could say. And then we're going to call pushback, which in C++ terms is a non-const method, of course. Uh, and in Rust terms, that means that this method is sort of implicitly going to take a mutable reference. That's if shared references are the const pointers, then mutable references are the non-const pointers. So this push method implicitly takes a mutable reference to the vec. That makes sense. It's trying to mutate it. Uh, and then we dereference the const pointer shared reference again at the end. Uh, this is runtime undefined behavior in C++. It's a, it's a dangling pointer. We see that when we turn on the address sanitizer, ASAN, uh, we can we can catch that reliably. We get a really nice error output here that tells us exactly what's going on. Heap use after free, right? So I'm hoping this is pretty familiar uh, on one side or the other. Probably for a lot of people, it's familiar on the C++ side. We see this all the time with Vector. So this is a mistake we have to watch out for. And like I just said, the Rust output on the left here uh, is not sanitizer output, even though I, I did turn on the sanitizer and we will get to that. We will force Rust to do this <laughs> using unsafe code. But here with safe code, we have not written any unsafe code. We cannot force Rust to do this. This is actually a compiler error. Um, and again, we're going to skip over almost all the basics. What, right after we leave this slide, we're not going to talk about many of them again. But just to cover exactly what we need for this talk, uh, there's a specific rule that this code is is, is breaking from Rust's perspective. Uh, and I call it the no mutable aliasing rule. Uh, so the rule is when you have a mutable reference to something, that's like a non-const pointer, uh, which is what the push method takes automatically to the vector, uh, that, ref that reference must not be aliased by any other reference while it's alive. So you can't have any other mutable references at the same time. You can only have one. You can't have any other shared references either. Sort of like saying when you have a non-const pointer to something, you can't have any other pointers. So that's a very strict rule in Rust. It's uh, one of the biggest practical differences between Rust and C++. 
And it is the way that Rust rejects this particular program. So we can see that in the compiler errors. Rust is going to call this shared reference an immutable borrow. It's just some vocabulary there. Shared reference, const pointer. Uh, and it's going to notice that this mutable borrow, the mutable reference here, the non-const pointer that this push method implicitly takes, conflicts with that shared reference. The, the, the mutable reference wants to be the only one. Uh, so this code is illegal. So that's cool. This code is bad. <laughs> so it's, it's nice that it's illegal. Uh, it's good that Rust rejects this. That's not, you know, one of the nice features of Rust, right? No undefined behavior. And, and frequently, that's because of compile time checks, which is great. So we're going to move on. And, and try to explore some unsafe code. Uh, and what we'll do first is we'll force Rust to compile this. So we'll use unsafe code to break this rule, because you know we can. That is a thing unsafe code can do. We shouldn't, but you know we will, <laughs> just for fun. We'll see it trigger the sanitizer. Um, and that'll be our introduction to what unsafe code looks like. One nice misconception to clear up early on, and this is I'm going to change slides now or go to the next example. So. What has changed is here, uh, and I like to, I like to highlight this as an example of something that does not work. So some folks who haven't uh, played with much unsafe code in Rust sometimes have the impression that when we write the unsafe keyword, it turns off the borrow checker or something similar. Like it sort of just deactivates all the safety rules. Um, and while there is some truth to that metaphorically, it is not literally true. And, and when you tr try to sprinkle unsafe code on this example like this, uh, it, it doesn't help. Right, so we still see that we have the exact same compiler error before. This this mutable aliasing rule is still in place and is still enforced by the compiler. Unsafe doesn't change that at all. And in fact, we get this actually we get this warning that's just telling us that this unsafe block that we've added here does nothing. So it's it's nice to clear that up from the beginning that like turning off all the checks is not what unsafe code does. Um, so we're on the next slide. We'll see what unsafe code actually does. So this is how we can force Rust to compile this code. So. Again, the C++ code hasn't changed. On the left here, what we see is that we are casting this shared reference into what Russ is going to call a const raw pointer. So before I said that there are two pointer types in Rust, and there are really four. So there's shared and mutable references, which are the safe ones. And there are uh, const and mutable raw pointers, which are like the unsafe ones. And all of these things are pointers. You know, at runtime, they're all 64 bits of pointer. Uh, that's what they are. But the shared reference and mutable reference participate in the all the compile time safety checks and lifetime tracking, the borrow checker, and all that stuff. And the raw pointers do not participate in any of those compile time checks. So there are still rules for what they're allowed to do, but those rules are not enforced by the compiler for the most part. Um, we, we create this uh, raw pointer here. It's actually safe to create it. But then, because it does not participate in any of those compile time checks, dereferencing it requires unsafe code. So here we, here we see ourselves doing something that we are not allowed to do in safe code. If I deleted this unsafe block, this code would not compile. Uh, so dereferencing a raw pointer, which we've cast, this type that we've cast to here, uh, requires unsafe code. And that's going to be the pattern in general. We're, you know, unsafe code is a big subject, and we're not going to cover most of it. Uh, we don't have time. But in general, you'll see that when you're doing unsafe things in Rust, that usually involves some sort of unsafe oriented helper types, things like that, or, or unsafe functions that can only be used in unsafe code. You, that, that's sort of how it tends to work. And all of your safe code, which may or may not have had errors, will still have all the errors that it did or didn't have once you put it in an unsafe context. The safe code doesn't really change. That's the pattern here. So we're using unsafe code to force Rust to dereference this, this const raw pointer. Uh, because of this cast, Rust no longer sees a conflict uh, with the mutable reference that's taken in push. We manage to compile, and we see that we get very similar output. In fact, I think we get literally exactly the same output. The line numbers are, are different. The stack traces are different. But I believe it's the same Clang address sanitizer on both sides. So that's pretty cool. So we've got the C++ compiler and the Rust compiler using the same sanitizer. So cool. Uh, this is uh, We have used unsafe code to force Rust to compile something that it wasn't going to compile before. That is a thing we can do. We should typically avoid this. We should avoid breaking this rule. Um, and you know, we would never use unsafe code to do this because it is, you know, taking dangling references into a vector is not good. But uh, this is a good example. This is an example of where the safety checks were helping us avoid bad code. Uh, what we're going to move on to next is a potentially more frustrating example where the safety checks are preventing us from writing code that we might have imagined was safe. So let's look at the next one. 
So here's uh, this code, if you'll forgive me, uh, this code has a bit of a song and dance with pointers. Uh, I'll walk through it. I, I switched to C now. It could have been C++. It would be the same. Uh, I'll, let's walk through what the C code is doing. Uh, and then we'll talk about why it doesn't compile in Rust and whether we should have wished it would compile. Uh, so let's look at C. So we have this function, foo, and it's taking integers x and y, so two integer pointers, non-const. And we assign through the x pointer, we write to the integer that x is pointing to, we assign through the y pointer, and then we read back through the x pointer for the return value. So whatever x is pointing to is now 42, whatever y is pointing to is now 99, and we return the current value of x. Um, we might look at that and kind of imagine it should always return 42. That is definitely what it looks like it's going to do. Uh, but if we if we continue reading and get to main, we'll see that it's a little more complicated than that. This is the song and dance that this is, that we're doing here. Uh, we create some integer n, and then we're going to call foo with two pointers to n. So so x and y are both pointing to n here. Well, uh, another way of saying that is x and y are aliasing in this case. They are sort of two different names for the same thing. So we can cheat and <laughs> look down here at the uh, output. Yeah, oh, we see that okay, the program's actually in print ninety nine. Godbolt will run your program and, and, and show you the output, which is great. Uh, but if we, if, we, if we follow the logic carefully, we can see why that's the case. So in this case, we're assigning 42 to n, because that's, that's what x is pointing to here, right? And then we're assigning 99 to n, again, because that's what y is pointing to. That's the aliasing issue. So when we return the value of n, well, now it's 99, right? So what we see is that the, the behavior of foo, what foo is doing is returning 42 most of the time, but when x and y are pointing to the same integer, it's returning 99. That's, that's, what, that's the behavior of foo. And the C compiler understands that and respects that. And we see that our program does that. Uh, it does that at the highest optimization level there. It does it with the undefined behavior sanitizer turned on. We see no problem, right? I'm relatively confident that this code does not contain any undefined behavior. I think this is perfectly sound and conformant C. I uh, would not bet my life on that, but I've, I've done everything I can to convince myself that this is perfectly fine C. Okay. So the Rust code doesn't compile. And seeing why it doesn't compile is not too hard, right? because we just said that there's the no mutable aliasing rule. So we just said that what we're doing here where we create these two references to n is never going to fly in Rust, right? Rust is going to look at that and be like, right, that's the most fundamental rule about mutable references that cannot alias. So Rust is just going to reject this code on that basis. So this is a kind of trivial example, and maybe no one feels very strongly about it. But when we run into this sort of thing, when we run into this type of error in practice, which is pretty common in Rust, Sometimes it feels frustrating because sometimes we feel like, like, you know, come on, Rust, like, what's wrong with this code? Like, couldn't we just agree to compile this? You know, like, there's no allocating or freeing in this code. None of these pointers are ever going to be dangling, right? There's no threads or any other scary stuff that causes undefined behavior all over the place. Like, no, 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 no. This is a super simple program. There's like literally only one integer in this program. We we take some pointers to it, which are definitely not dangling. Like. What's the harm? You know, come on, Rust. Like, what's the harm? I think I think some people start to reach for the term false positive in this case. I think you know some people feel like this is an example where the rules are too strict, and I sympathize with that. Uh, certainly, insofar as the similar-looking C code is totally fine, it does feel like Rust is being very strict here. Uh, but what we're going to see, and I think this is very surprising, is that when we force Rust to compile this code by making it unsafe in just the right way, we use unsafe code to force Rust to compile this, this is going to trigger undefined behavior. Like, for real, like it's going to print the wrong thing. I think it's very surprising. Uh, and let's, let's see it happen. So here we go. So nothing about foo has changed. And I want to remind us all that foo is all safe code. Right? So there's no unsafe keyword in foo, no, no, you know, no, no raw pointers. Right? These are safe shared references. We've tweaked main a bit to, to kind of trick Rust into compiling it. So we have a, a mutable non-const raw pointer here. We're doing the same casting trick. So Rust is not going to track the lifetime of this thing. And then we use unsafe code to break the rule. Right? We, we, we create two mutable references, safe mutable references, back to n. We're not supposed to do that. We cannot do that in safe code, but we can do it here. We can kind of force the issue. And then if we look on the right at the output, we start to see the problem right here. That's where we see the problem, right? So with, with uh, optimizations off, that's what Rust calls debug mode, um, we get the correct answer. This, the code that we've written, to the extent that it's valid code at all, really should return 99. Uh, that is the correct answer. And with optimizations on, we get the wrong answer. 
we get garbage here. So this program that might have felt like a false positive, right, might have felt like Rust kind of getting ahead of itself, being way too strict. It's like, well, wait a minute. This is interesting. When we force the issue, it is undefined behavior. That's weird. What we're seeing here is that this, this no mutable aliasing rule is not just a safe code rule, right? It's, it's not the sort of training wheels of the Rust language where you, know, you can break it once you know what you're doing. No, no. It's actually a hard and fast rule of the Rust memory model. And if you break it using unsafe code, that's the only way to break it, uh, you will trigger undefined behavior and the compiler will have compiled your code under the assumption that you never do that. Uh, so that's, that can be very surprising. Um, and just to sort of prove the point, in case, in case there was any doubt uh, that this was undefined behavior, um, we, we do have tools that can confirm this. It's sort of the equivalent of ASAN and UBSAN. Uh, here I'm pulling up an example that's from the Rust Playground. Uh, and again, I'll link to all of these in the description. So this is all the same code and we could run it. Uh, running it in debug mode, we'll print the right answer. Running it in release mode, that turns the optimizations on. We'll see that prints the wrong answer. Right? We just saw that, it's the same code. Uh, and there's this great tool called Miri, which is the sort of like, yeah, Rust version of UBSAN in a way, uh, which will check these things very aggressively. It'll insert lots of extra checks into your code to catch violations of these rules. Click that, run this under Miri, uh, and we'll get very clear output, like boom, you know, undefined behavior, right? Like Miri makes it very clear, like you have broken the rules, like this is crap. <laughs> you cannot write this code. You cannot expect it to do anything predictable, right? So. Miri is very useful for this. Uh, yes, so let's, let's move on to some assembly and see how exactly the undefined behavior manifests itself uh, when we do force this, we do force Rust to compile this, we'll see why Rust is actually miscompiling our program and giving us garbage. So here we go. This is another Godbolt example. A lot of code here, bear with me. Uh, we've got four versions of Foo on the left. The first one is the Rust one that we just saw. Uh, and then this one down here, the third one is the C implementation we just saw. So this, we have two Rust versions on the top, the one we saw and this one using purely unsafe code. Then we have the familiar C one that we saw. And then we have another C version that uses this fancy keyword called restrict, which some folks may not have seen. We'll talk about that. So let's start back up here. On the right, for each of these, we have x86 assembly. Uh, I have all the optimizations turned on in each case. Um, and x86 assembly is like, you know, folks who don't read it frequently, you know, it's like, it looks like nonsense, right? I totally sympathize. Uh, we don't need to get into any of the details really, but you, you, the important things to know are these square brackets here uh, indicate some sort of pointer operation. So in this case, these are pointer rights. Uh, of course, we can look to the left and see exactly what line kind of corresponds here and, and guess what that's doing. So these, these square brackets represent the pointer operation. And then EAX here is the return value register. And you don't need to know that unless you work with compilers or have to write a lot of assembly. But that helps us interpret this uh, example and you kind of get used to it if you see a lot of these. The EX is the return value register. So we're assigning 42 to the return value basically with this line here. So what we see is that the Rust compiler with optimizations turned on has hard coded return value 42. And that's like, that's, we know that that's the wrong thing to do uh, if X and Y can alias. So we, what we're seeing here is that Rust is assuming that they cannot alias, right? It's taking that no mutable aliasing rule and kind of asserting it about the whole world and spitting out assembly code that is only correct if we never violate that rule. I think that's very interesting. Um, and if we look at the next two examples of pure unsafe Rust, so in this case, both of these arguments are raw pointers, we use unsafe code to dereference them, and the C code right next to it, we see that those give the same compiler output in both cases. So in those cases, this third line here, we see that that's a, that's a third pointer operation, a pointer read in this case, that's on the other side. So, so sure enough, right, C and unsafe Rust uh, are following, are doing what we said, right? We said to return the value of a pointer read, this is the, the implicit return in the Rust syntax, right? Um, and when it's purely unsafe, Rust is respecting that, uh, and C is respecting that also. So, so both compilers are, are totally aware of this issue where X and Y are allowed to alias in these cases, and that they're not allowed to alias in this case. Uh, 
If we go down to the bottom, we see the restrict keyword. Uh, restrict is a slightly fancy. We only use it in niche optimization cases in C, uh, and it's not even standard in C++. Though you can usually get compiler-specific versions of it, like for GCC and Clang. But it, 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 it's enough to say that it basically makes the same promise. So the restrict keyword is promising the compiler that X and Y do not alias. Fair enough. So it's the same situation as above. And we see, yep, sure enough, right, like the compiler gives exactly the same uh, assembly output here. Um, it's not too surprising that these are exactly the same because, of course, uh, Rust-C and Clang are both based on LLVM. So it's actually the same compiler backend in both cases. So it's not too surprising that we get like exactly the same code. Uh, but it's also a pretty simple program, so we might expect that anyway. Uh, so that's that's what we see here. So hmm. the title of this talk was <laughs> Unsafe Rust is not C. But <laughs> this example makes it look a lot like C, uh, to be fair. You know? you know, we see that when we write this purely unsafe code, it is compiled much like C. Uh, so in this case, the, you know, pretty similar. <laughs> uh, that's true. Um, the huge, huge difference here is that when we're writing any Rust, including unsafe Rust, when we're writing Rust, 95, 99% of the code that we're interacting with is safe code, right? When we're writing applications, the vast majority of that is safe code. So when we're writing unsafe code like this, our callers and the, in the people we're returning our, our return values to are probably safe code. So most of Rust is, is, do, is, is following the same rules that C only follows when you use the restrict keyword. The defaults are different. And so when we write unsafe code, this is a serious concern that, because we, we have to interface with code that's handing references around and we must never, never, never create aliasing references in, in these, these safe reference types which are all over the place in Rust. They're the, they're the standard Rust reference types. So, so we had, even though it's sort of the same situation between Rust and C in a way, the defaults are totally different in Rust, and we have this interface problem between safe and unsafe code everywhere. Anywhere you write unsafe code, you're interfacing with safe code, you have to worry about the safety rules. Uh, and I know these examples can seem a little trivial. Uh, see, folks who don't write a ton of C and C++ might not spend a ton of time thinking about undefined behavior. And maybe the fact that it's just an integer here makes it seem like it's not a big deal. But it could be anything, right? I, I want to emphasize that the, we could be returning pointers here instead of integers. Right? We could be returning function pointers. Who knows what we could be returning, right? And when the compiler is not respecting the code that we wrote because we've broken the rules of the memory model, uh, all bets are off, and this can cause arbitrarily bad consequences. And I think folks who debug a lot of undefined behavior in C and C++ and Rust uh, will will agree. So, uh, moving on. So this this is this is a quick example. I'm not going to belabor it because it's it's a bunch of compiler nonsense that doesn't make sense to anybody, not even to the folks who write a lot of Rust. This is just a nonsense example, but this is just to emphasize the point. It's actually slightly worse than I just made it seem. Uh, even easier to break the rules than I might have just made it seem. Um, when we run this code through Miri, we see that this is also undefined behavior, same error. And in this case, we can see that this, this program doesn't even do anything. Like it, it creates the integer 42, it, it prints it at the end, it never changes it. Like this, this program never modifies the integer. It doesn't do any assignments, uh, but it creates pointers in such a way where the the brief existence of this mutable reference, this, this mutable reference, which is not even retained, it's a temporary that only li lives on line four and it's gone by the time we get to line five. The brief existence of this mutable reference on line four is enough for Miri to consider this code undefined behavior. And that's horrifying. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if the Rust compiler will make any optimizations on this basis yet, but I think it will certainly have permission to and may actually do that in the future. Uh, there, the, the exact details of uh, raw pointers and unsafe code in the Rust memory model are a little bit up in the air and it hasn't been standardized yet. Uh, but the model that Miri is using to check this, I think is likely to be at least very close to the, the, the future model that Rust adopts. So uh, I think folks who plan to write unsafe code should, should spend some time uh, staring at this example and feeling <laughs> bad about how, how easy it is to break this rule. I, in, in, in preparing the examples for this talk, I broke this rule like three or four times. And the, the, the Rust code in this talk 
that it's supposed to be sound. Like I ran it all through the Miri checker to, to make sure that it's sound. And like the first two or three times I did that, like it was wrong. Like I broke this rule several times uh, making this talk uh, accidentally, not even counting the times I did it deliberately. So it, it is really easy to break this rule. And when we write unsafe code in Rust, particularly any code that is dealing with pointers and might be returning safe references or instantiating safe references, uh, we have to worry about this. This is, this, is, this is a very tricky rule to follow. It's nice that we have tools. I'm very, very glad that Miri exists. Uh, this is a very tricky rule to follow. And stepping back from that, I, I, I think some people see examples like this and think like, like what the hell, Rust? Like, oh, I, wait a minute. I thought our code was supposed to be safer, right? I, I, I thought it was supposed to be easier to write correct code. Like, what are we doing here? Like, whoa. Yeah. And I think that's a fair reaction. Uh, and and if you're not having that reaction, you might you might want to take another look at this example. Um, like this is like what like why is this so hard? Like how you know why are we making it so hard to write correct code? The whole point is making our you know correctness and speed and you know ergonomics. Uh, but correctness is very high on the list. And I think there are a couple different answers to that. Um, one of the answers is because there's such a clean separation between safe and unsafe code. And we're a little bit more comfortable with the rules for unsafe code being pretty, you know, tough. Having that playing hardball with unsafe code because, well, we don't write unsafe code most of the time, and we never do that accidentally. Uh, and it's relatively easy to review or audit code and see what's going on in the unsafe parts. Uh, it's not necessarily easy to audit those parts, but those parts are easy to identify, right? So, you know, okay, so that that explains some of the aggression here. Um, but I think a second part of the answer. Is, is, is best explained by looking at some examples of C code uh, that has undefined behavior that we might not have expected. So that's, that's what we're gonna look at for the next couple of examples. We'll look at some C code that has undefined behavior. We'll kind of compare notes there, and then we'll finish off at the end with, uh, yeah, kind of like, why do we do all this sort of thinking. So here we go into C code. So no more rust for a moment, uh, just some C. So, you know, we see on the right, okay, 99, 42, 99. So clearly something similar is going on here. We're going to end up committing the same issue, you know, violation in C. This would also have worked in C++. So what are we doing? Uh, we have these two struct types, uh, foo and bar. They each contain an integer x. Okay, so they, they're like identical looking types. So they have a different name, uh, but otherwise they look very identical. Our function f here is going to take a pointer to a foo and a pointer to a bar, and then it's going to do pretty much the exact same song and dance we just did. So we're kind of familiar with this code, right? It like sort of looks like this function is always going to return 42, but in the case where these are aliasing, we're going to see that we we would have expected it to return 99, uh, and and you know, lo and behold, like that's exactly what we do, right? So we create a foo, and then we use a pointer cast to convert that foo pointer into a bar pointer, and we call f, and I think uh, experienced C and C++ programmers might look at that pointer cast and be like, that doesn't feel safe. And they would be right. Uh, it is not safe um, that you can't do that. Uh, but explaining why you can't do that can be tricky sometimes. Uh, the rule that is being broken here is is not a simple rule. Um, but we can, we can see that basically the same issue happens. So the compiler, when optimizations are turned on here in this middle case here, uh, the top case is, is optimizations off. Uh, the compiler with optimizations on is going to assume that foo and bar cannot alias. And so it's going to assume, just like it did before, that this write of 99 cannot possibly affect foo. Uh, and so it's going to hard code the return value here. Right? It's exactly the same optimization. Uh, but I mean, in this case, it's triggering in C. And we did not use the restrict keyword. So it turns out that the rule that the compiler is following here, sometimes called the strict aliasing rule, um, the rule says in the standard that when you access an object through a pointer, that pointer, in this case the bar star pointer, um, has to be of a compatible type. And the rules for compatibility in this sense are, uh, there's like several of them, there's like eight bullet points and it, it can be a little hard to follow. Um, but the important thing to know here is that foo and bar are not compatible, even though they are guaranteed to have the same memory layout. And we might naively assume that how could they be any more compatible than they already are? Well, they're not compatible. That's what the standard says. And the, and the compiler is allowed to assume that foo star uh, and bar star do not alias each other ever. So ac technically accessing bar through a pointer of the wrong type is undefined behavior according to the standard. What actually happens in practice is that the compiler makes aliasing assumptions. So in practice, 
it's it's undefined behavior to do this and alias. But in theory, it's undefined behavior to do line 13 at all. So watch out. You know, there could be other compiler optimizations I'm not aware of that can also exploit this. Um, so yes, so it's the same sort of restrict style rule, but we didn't write restrict. We just ran a foul of a pointer aliasing rule in C and C++ that not everyone knows about. It can be easy to forget about. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one. This third example here with an obscure sounding compiler flag uh, fixes the problem. We'll, we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, we'll see that on the next slide also. So that's this example. Okay. Here's another example. So similar but different. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side, same compiler flag, same output. So we're triggering exactly the same problem again. Uh, how are we doing it this time? So here we have just one struct type, foo, and there's two integers in foo. We got x and y, okay. And in main, we're gonna create three integers in an array, so those are guaranteed to be packed together. And we're gonna, we're gonna create a foo pointer sort of covering the first two integers. And we're gonna create another foo pointer covering like the second and third integer. So it's sort of like the, the, the foo window has slid over by one. So like, like foo one and foo two are half overlapping, if that makes sense, uh, which again, I, I'm sure experienced programmers look at this and are like, why would you, like, please don't do that. And yes, this is for an example, but you know, sometimes we do fancy things with arrays. Um, and what we see, you know, lo and behold, right, 42.99, right, return, return the first one. So it's, it's the same stuff, it's the same story. You know, it looks like the C compiler is gonna assume that these things do not alias. In this case, it's interesting because they're the same type. So we have not violated the strict aliasing rule that we saw on the, the previous slide. It's not that we're accessing it through, uh, uh, of the wrong type, it's that actually a separate rule in the C standard says that if you have a read from one object and a write to another, which is a pretty broad set of, of operations, but I that's what the C standard says, uh, read from one object and write to another, they must be either the exact same object or completely disjoint and not overlapping at all. So this, the C standard says a read from one object and a write to another object is undefined behavior if they are partially overlapping. Well, that's what they're doing in this case, so you know, fair enough, but it's interesting. I, I, I don't, I, I'm pretty sure that the pointer casts and on lines 16 and 17 and the uh, writes on lines nine and 10 are each by themselves allowed. I, I could be wrong, but I, I believe each of these is allowed. And it's in fact only the combination of these two writes side by side that's not allowed by the standard. And again, in practice, what we see here is the, the compiler uh, exploiting this rule to make aliasing assumptions. Probably, if, if we sort of step back and think about the history of compilers, um, probably what happened is that compilers built this rule in without asking anybody, uh, and then someone eventually standardized it. Uh, I, I assume that's the way these things go sometimes, and maybe this time. I don't know the history of this rule, uh, but that's a rule. It's a, it's a somewhat obscure rule. Uh, so there's sort of two strict aliasing rules, at least. Uh, there may be more. We do see this pointer, uh, this pointer, this flag here, uh, F no strict aliasing. So, so that, is, that is telling Clang, GCC has the same flag. That tells Clang and GCC like, like hold your horses here, you know, like back off a little bit. Uh, yeah, you're allowed to assume these things about aliasing pointers, but like, please don't. Uh, so we see that in these cases, uh, the, 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 the flag F no strict aliasing fixes our code. So it, it, it tells GCC not to make that assumption here. Um, I, you know, this is a non-standard flag, of course, right? The standard doesn't say anything about defining this flag. I don't believe it exists uh, on MSVC. It might under a different name. I'm sure someone will correct me in the comments, but um, this is an non-standard flag. Uh, it turns out that some very prominent software projects, including the Linux kernel, uh, require this flag, which I think is very interesting. So the, the Linux kernel actually will not build, or actually it will probably build, but not run, uh, uh, if you compile it without this flag. So it sort of requires this non-standard extension to C. Um, so what we're seeing here is that the, the, the C aliasing rules in practice are somewhat punishing. Uh, and it's not necessarily uncommon for important projects to break those rules and to need kind of an escape hatch here. Um, I, 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 do, I do wanna be clear that I think it is a little bit less common to break these rules in C and C++ than it is to make aliasing mistakes in unsafe Rust, right? Because in unsafe Rust, we're, like, we're, we're creating these safe references 
all the time, you know, when we interface with safe code. And every time we do that, we have to be super careful. These aliasing issues in C and C++ are a little bit more obscure. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say that this is something we do all the time, uh, sometimes. Um, and so it, it is probably less common that folks run into them. Uh, it's part of the reason that they're obscure. But, so, you know, perhaps that's a reason that these might be a little bit less scary. I, I, I agree with that. But I want to highlight here that these examples do not fail address sanitizer or UBSAN. So none of the standard checkers, sanitizers or Val Valgrind also, uh, Valgrind doesn't know anything about these pointer types, right? None of the standard checkers will catch these. Nothing, nothing, no, no, there may be some compiler warnings that you can turn on, but there's no sanitizer that I'm aware of that will reliably or even unreliably uh, catch this undefined behavior example. So this mistake that we have to watch out for in C and C++, we have to be very careful because the tools are not helping. Uh, I find that somewhat scary. Even though these mistakes are a little bit rarer, um, the tools are not helping you catch them, even if your tests are good. So you have to watch out for that. I'm not going to spend too much time on it before we get to the end. We're about to wrap up, but I'll just tab through quickly. This is a Rust copy, an unsafe Rust copy of the, the first uh, undefined behavior example in C. And this is uh, an unsafe Rust uh, copy of the second example with the, the half overlapping foos. And what we see in both of these cases, go back, going back 99.99 and going forward 99.99, is that unsafe Rust actually does not have these rules which is interesting. So these particular aliasing rules that C and C++ have, this is an example where unsafe Rust is actually arguably simpler than C and C++. At least today, uh, it's possible future standards could change. I would be a little surprised by that. Uh, but at least today, um, unsafe Rust is a little bit simpler in these particular ways. I think overall, it's more difficult because the safe reference aliasing rules are really easy to break. Uh, you really have to watch out for that. But in these particular ways, it's a little easier. That's interesting. Okay, so we've seen how unsafe Rust and C and C++ are, are different. There are some rules that exist on both sides uh, that, that don't exist on the other side. In all these cases, we have to be careful. Uh, why do we do this to ourselves? So here's, here's a final slide, final example, uh, to try to kind of, as an apology for compilers, I guess. I think compilers are amazing, and this is an example of how compilers are amazing. Um, and just sort of explain some of uh, our suffering here. We're going to see sort of basically four versions of the same function. The last one's in Rust. The first three are in C. And we're going to look at some compiler optimizations that trigger sometimes, but not other times. So uh, really quick, what is this function doing, right? Each, each of these functions is the same. They take two arguments. The first is an array of 16 ints. Um, and the second is some int pointer x. Uh, and the idea is that we want to add the value that x is pointing to to each of the elements of the array. So we loop over the array. We add star x each time. Uh, it's the same code in all, in all these languages. Uh, just little, little tweaks, differences in the arguments. So what we see in the first example, this, of course, is too small for anyone to read. <laughs> it's just sort of emphasizing how many instructions are here. So let me, let me make that bigger. So what we see in this case is the compiler does unroll the loop. That's nice. So it sort of copies the, the two instructions of the body of the loop uh, 16 times. Um, so it's, you know, unrolling the loop saves you a branch and a jump, right? Um, so the, we load the, the X pointer each time through the loop. We don't load it once. Uh, and then we have a separate add instruction for each, uh, each addition into the elements of the array. OK, I mean, it makes sense that there, it may make sense that there are 16 add instructions. Why are there 16? moves? Why are there 16 loads of the value x? Well, the reason is that the compiler knows that x could be aliasing this array. So it is possible for the x pointer to point into our array argument here. And if it does that, then one of these, these additions here, one of these increments, could modify the value that x is pointing to, and that would affect the value of all subsequent elements of the array. So that could happen. Um, the compiler is being defensive about that. I, I will freely admit, <laughs> this, is, this is a little bit weird. It, it's a little weird to take x by pointer here. I, I'm not suggesting this is code that the, the human would write necessarily. Um, instead, I, it might make more sense to think of this as code that the compiler might run into in the middle of its optimization passes, right? Maybe the compiler has inlined some functions and sort of gotten rid of some struct abstractions or whatever. And, and it's sort of the compiler ends up seeing this code and wants to keep optimizing it. Um, that's probably more likely. I, I think if we were writing this code by hand, we would take the integer by value. But uh, fair enough, right? So you know, this is code the compiler might run into on the inside more often. 
And it can't do too much with this code, but we see that in all these other examples, it does quite a lot. Uh, let's look real quick at exactly what it does. It, reading assembly is a drag, but um, I, have, I have sneakily enabled uh, this flag, which says that the compiler is allowed to use the latest, greatest uh, SIMD vector extensions on modern Intel processors, these, these gigantic 512-bit registers uh, and operations on those registers. I'm, I'm giving the compiler permission to use those since it, for the purposes of an example to make a splashy point. What we see here uh, is that we get we get one read. If I scroll over here, we get one one read of the X pointer. Uh, we get one addition. Uh, we we add. Uh, what do we do here? We add the X to the entire array in one add instruction, uh, and then we write. I believe this writes the array back out. So there's a, there's a read of X, there's a write of the whole array in one instruction, and there's a single add that does all 16 of uh, those additions. This is, this is magic, right? Like this, this is it's crazy. There, the compiler takes one look at this loop, and it's like, I know three instructions that implement that loop. I think that is, that is absolutely magic. Um, sometimes I feel frustrated at my compilers. Uh, this is one of those times I feel very grateful for my compilers. Um, why was the compiler able to optimize this example here? Because of the restrict keyword, right? So we've seen that before. So the restrict is telling the compiler that you don't have to worry about X aliasing anything. Uh, and so the, the compiler does not have to worry about these writes into the array, changing the value of X. And so it's just whoosh, we have this amazing optimization. Right? And we just spent all this time talking about all the punishment and all the mistakes that we have to watch out for. This is, this is the reward, right? This is, this is why, this is why we, we, we go through all this pain. The third example is not using restrict um, maybe again, a little quirky, you know, maybe, you know, the, 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 the human would probably not make this choice as an optimization, but it could so happen that the, that X was of type in 64 instead of in 32, right? Could happen. The compiler could get lucky. I think that's the way I want to think about this example. And if the compiler gets lucky and these happen to be of different integer types, even though we're doing math with them and kind of making an implicit cast here, it, the compiler's like, ooh, nice. I can use that strict aliasing rule. I can make the aliasing assumptions that I really wanted to make here. Boom, I can optimize that, that loop. We get almost exactly the same instructions. I think very slightly different. Um, and the, the restrict keyword, again, is not here. We didn't have to write that. And of course, we don't write it very often. You know, the, the compiler writers know that they can't expect us to write restrict everywhere. So they're very happy to have these opportunities where some quirky rules uh, mean that they often luck into being able to make optimizations that would otherwise have required the restrict keyword to enable, or again, you know, taking X by value. But this is just an example. The Rust example on the right, uh, you know, it's got some syntax, uh, but same idea, right? And we can see that we get the same, exactly the same uh, assembly output. I think it's exactly the same assembly output as the restrict example. Um, and you know, why is Rust able to optimize this? Well, of course, we know why, right? We have the mutable aliasing rule. We know that this reference to array uh, cannot alias anything uh, at all. Uh, we also separately know that the shared reference to X, the, the, the integer that it references, could be alias, but will never be mutated uh, while X is alive. We actually know more than we need to know to optimize this example. Either one of those two things individually is enough to make this optimization. Uh, and we see that Rust can do this. So Rust, you know, because the no mutable aliasing rule is assumed everywhere, uh, Rust has very strong aliasing information all the time. And we see, we're seeing here why Rust doesn't need anything like C's strict aliasing rule with pointer types or the thing about overlapping. This, this is why Rust doesn't need those. It's like Rust has no problem optimizing examples like this. Rust has really strong aliasing information all the time. So that's a benefit. And if we might have imagined an alternate universe where you know, maybe, maybe the, the no mutable aliasing rule was only a rule for safe code and it might have been nicer if unsafe code was allowed to break that rule, I sympathize with that. That would make it easier to write unsafe code. But this example here is one way to understand the value that we get from imposing that rule on all code. Uh, and of course, when we do create mutable aliasing, we can do all sorts of other bad things too, like the very first example with the vector, right? So there's, there are many things that that rule is protecting us from. Uh, but uh, even when we know what we're doing, uh, or so we think, even in those cases, this rule is providing us with valuable optimizations. And if we didn't have this rule, Rust would need something. 
maybe something more like C. I don't know what the alternative would be. But it does make a certain sense. It has a certain cleanliness of design to have kind of the same rule applied everywhere. And in the case of unsafe rust, it can be surprising that the rule applies to unsafe rust also, even though the rule itself is not surprising. We always have to learn it when we learn to write safe code. It's the first thing we do. Uh, it can be surprising that the rule applies to unsafe code also, but at least we know the rule. Uh, I think it's our experience with C and C++ that, can, that, can, that, can, that makes that surprising because we know that that does not apply often in C and C++, but it does apply in Rust. We have to watch out for that. There's some tricky pitfalls in both languages. Um, you know, writing unsafe code is tricky. Uh, luckily, we do have tools that help us at least somewhat uh, nail that down. So good luck out there. Uh, enjoy it. If you, if you want to learn more about unsafe Rust, the Rustonomicon book, it's one of the official books, is excellent. It's a fire hose of information. Um, but if you're going to be writing Unsafe Rust, I highly recommend you read it. There are many other rules for Unsafe Rust code that we did not cover here. So be careful. <laughs> Have fun out there. Uh, talk to you guys later.